there were two places that were possible. One was Mossman, the other was Hunter's Hill. Uh, I chose Mossman, Clifton Gardens, because the first ferry ran at six o'clock. The first ferry from Hunter's Hill didn't run until about seven, which meant that you lost an hour's working time. Why to cross the bridge? <coughs> well, it was that we couldn't afford to live in the eastern suburbs. Then once we had moved to Mossman, we moved to Clifton Gardens and stayed there in the same house for just on 37 years. And uh, there'd be no way that I'd ever go back to the eastern suburbs. Uh, you haven't got the open space, you haven't got the bushland. You didn't have then the community sense that you have now or did have, less I think these days than it was back in 1965 when we came to Mossman. But economics dictated it initially and then the quality of the environment kept us here. I came into the council in December 1968. The elections used to be in December, they're now in September. The reason that I came into the council was uh, I'd moved to Clifton Gardens in January 65. I'd met up with the Bradley sisters, become involved in bushland regeneration, uh, which was close to my heart. And then in 67, 68, uh, there was a building erected by a man called Earl Cameron down at 17 Raglan Street. It was almost on the point. Uh, a quite fine house had been demolished. Well, that was not good, but it wasn't all bad. But the building that was erected there was very high, very prominent. It started off three stories higher than it is now when it was found that uh, it exceeded what was allowed under Schedule 7 of the Local Government Act. But what really <coughs> got me into the council was going on the ferry each morning, I would see the spoil that had been just tipped down the foreshore, massacring the trees and turning it into really a rubble dump. And I kept railing against this and saying, they shouldn't allow this to happen. And some people on the ferry said, well, why don't you do something about it? So I thought about it, discussed it with my wife and decided to stand for the council. And I did. Uh, the principal purpose being because of that building and what I thought was slackness on the part of the council and a policy decision to ensure that we had proper planning that didn't permit that sort of thing to happen. So I ran for the council and topped the poll which became a habit thereafter. And uh, I was independent of all the others. The Bradleys lived in Aluka Road, Joan and Eileen. Uh, they were both spinsters. Um, Joan was a science graduate. Uh, Eileen was an arts graduate. They were very different characters. Joan was very mannish. Uh, whenever you saw her in the bush, she would have her shorts on and a knife and a cigarette in her mouth. And uh, she was absolutely fearless when it came to uh, protecting the bushland. And she had a whole group of us who were working, weeding, Morella Road and various places like that to get rid of the lantana. And <coughs> She and Eileen had been concerned about the habitat for the blue wren. That's how they became interested in bushland. And then they devised a method for restoring bushland, not going in and raising it and burning, slash and burn, which was then the accepted norm, but rather working from the good to the bad so that you allowed the good to expand 
gradually. It was slow, but it was very effective. And she got me interested in that. Then I thought, well, we should try and get the National Trust involved. I wasn't president of the National Trust at that time. Uh, this was back in the 60s, early 70s, and I didn't become president of the National Trust until 1991. But uh, their method had been adopted by the National Trust, recognising that it was a long-term thing, not a, a year-by-year -year thing. And <coughs> the association between the National Trust and Mossman had always been good. There's a high percentage of Mossman people who are members of the National Trust. So Joan and Eileen were the uh, the Fonz at Origo of that. The National Trust then came in and of course when I became president of the National Trust I made sure that the association between Mossman and the National Trust remained. Uh, there was a very strong push to turn the Bradley Bushland Reserve into tennis courts. Uh, that was resisted and in uh, 1983, when we were coming up for an election, I could see that there was going to be a change in the composition of the council and that <coughs> unless the Bradley Bushland, or it wasn't called Bradley Bushland then, unless that parcel of bushland was protected in some way, it would become tennis courts, which I thought would be an abomination. So I devised a scheme whereby we named it as the Bradley Bushland Reserve after two pioneer women of Mossman. That would make it more difficult to turn it into tennis courts. And you'll find the plaque talks about that dedication taking place in September 1983. It took place just before the election. Now the election did change the nature of the council. But by that time, the fact that it was a named reserve after two uh, pioneers of bush regeneration and who were residents of Mossman protected the land. As we came further down the track, however, by 1986-87, there was a resurgence of people who wanted to turn it into, at least part of it, into an expansion of the tennis courts. So <clears throat> Lloyd Edwards and I then devised a secondary scheme and that was to get money from the Commonwealth uh, for the bicentenary and put it into the Bradley Bushland Reserve so that now if you were going to change its nature you would have to consult with the Commonwealth. So we got $35,000 and it was very interesting. It was to be presented by somebody from the Commonwealth. And I, as the mayor in, uh, would have been late 87, early 88, I think, um, was to get the check. I was in court and it was a difficult case. And my opponent just kept droning on and on. So it was getting closer and closer to the time, uh, around 3.30 I think it was, when we were due to get the money. I didn't finish in court until about 3. So I raced out. Uh, my clerk had ordered a taxi, which was on the opposite side of Phillips Street to my chambers. I raced out, getting dressed, putting my tie on as I uh, raced out onto the road and I was struck by a truck as I crossed the road and the near side mirror of the truck hit me in the chest and it smashed and the arm of the mirror dug into my chest and tore it. I didn't realise this. Um, I got into the taxi and the taxi driver said to me, would I lean forward please? I said, why? He said, because you're dripping blood on the seat. So I leant forward, there was blood everywhere. And I got out here to the Bradley Bushland Reserve, with all this crowd waiting, including the then Deputy Mayor, I think it was uh, Mrs. Le Leela Hutley, Mr. Justice Hutley's wife. Um, and my shirt was all stained and I was 
worried that it was going to spoil my suit, which was a very <laughs> expensive suit. <laughs> so Lee Hutley took my coat from me. It was a bitter cold day, I remember. And there is a photograph taken with this big stain, blood stain, all over my shirt and down into my trousers. And the headline on the daily was, the mayor sheds blood for Mossman. <laughs> but I got the 35,000. Now, it was Peter Clive was the, Peter, I remember, Peter Clive was the uh, deputy mayor and Lee Hutley took my coat. When it was over, the ceremony was over, we were to have a reception. Well, by that time I'd lost a lot of blood and I was feeling rather weak. And so I had to go to hospital. So Peter Clive conducted the reception and I went off to hospital to be stitched up and it was quite a dramatic time. But it meant that the Bradley Bushland Reserve now was twice dedicated, Commonwealth money safe. There are really two episodes. One was in the early 80s, when <clears throat> the Commonwealth was proposing to sell off for development the area of bushland and trees between what is now the walkway down to Balmoral from the extension of Middlehead Road and the hospital at HMAS Penguin. I can't remember how many acres there are, but there was a big protest about that down at Balmoral. And that's when I first met Tom Uren. Tom Uren, who uh, was strong uh, left-wing Labor, came down there and he and I stood on the same platform and addressed a very big crowd. Uh, and uh, the net result of that was the conjunction uh, between the council and Tom Uren with his strong Labour Party connections meant that that didn't happen. Tom still reminds me quite frequently about the time we were, we first met and stood on the platform together. Of course, Tom is one of these very tall men, six foot plus, and I'm five foot plus, not very many inches. <laughs> And the long and the short of it on this uh, platform must have been quite amusing for people to see, but it was very effective. And so we repulsed that. The second one was <coughs> when the, council, the uh, Commonwealth was shifting the military from Middlehead and George's Heights to Holdsworthy or wherever they were going to send Townsville as well, and there was a thing called the preferred solution. That would have involved many hundreds of uh, houses on Middlehead. The council agreed with it, I think because it felt it didn't have any alternative. But a number of us, Phil Jenkin of the Harbour Defenders, um, Don Goodsir, uh, of what is now the, um, the Headland Preservation Society, all clubbed together to oppose this. And I was strongly opposed to it and worked pretty hard. Then just before an election in, I think it was probably 1998, um, the then Prime Minister John Howard was convinced that all the defence lands around Sydney Harbour should go into one trust and um, that these lands should be made available for public access and not developed for private purposes. That was a genius decision. It meant that vast tracts of land around Sydney Harbour, including uh, North Head, um, Middle Head, George's Heights, Woolwich, Cockatoo Dock, um, and later the Lighthouse at, North, at uh, South Head and the former biological uh, station at Watson's Bay, all went into this uh, 
Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. For Mossman, it's been fantastic. For Sydney, it's been fantastic. The 52 ton rock down at um, uh, Mossman Bay, which was Great Sirius Cove. It was where HMS Sirius was careened in 1789 after it had done its round the world trip of 12,800 and something miles uh, to the Cape of Good Hope down through the roaring 40s and around the world to get provisions to keep the starving colony uh, alive. So it came back and it was careened there. <clears throat> so I thought it would be very nice to have some monument uh, that recorded those events. So we got a sculptor called Koloshi, uh, I think Hungarian in origin, interesting man, and we got him to do this bar relief. So David Martin was the governor, so we got him to open, the, unveil the uh, memorial. And he arrived by barge at the uh, wharf in full naval uniform, looked absolutely splendid. Now, he came up to unveil. All he had to do was pull uh, a cord. Brian Leckie was the engineer, and I said to Brian, Brian, for God's sake, make sure this blessed thing works. He said to me, Mr Mayor, it'll work. We've done it 12 times, and it worked every time. So Sir David comes up, and he pulls the cord, and nothing happens. So he pulls the cord again, and nothing happens. So he pulls it a third time and still nothing happens. So then he draws his sword and is about to slash the cord. And there are photographs, they'll be in the library here, of Sir David Martin with sword drawn. A great picture. Just then, a man whose name was not K-N-O-T-T, which I thought was rather amusing, raced out with a ladder, put it round the back of the rock and loosened the, uh, the uh, rope. And down it fell and it was opened. So uh, it's very dramatic, was, but was a, it's a great story for an event like that. Max Park was the town clerk at the time the library was opened. Um, the governor was late. He was worried. Max was worried. It was close to Christmas. Everything was happening. It wouldn't be ready. TC, I said to him, it will all work out, and it did. Um, the library itself was an interesting building. To get the council to agree to it was not easy. You had, to ha you had these disparate interests in the council, but this was going to be a building that, if it was properly done, would endure as a monument to all the aldermen who saw it as an important feature in Mossman. So there was a committee formed and I chaired this committee and we would meet and we, we had uh, a very, very good architect design it. In fact, I thought the building would get a prize. Then I was, I can't remember where I was and I saw this building that was sheathed in copper and I thought, what a wonderful finish this would give. As it aged, it would get the green verdigris on it, it would colour up and it would be a beautiful looking building. We had a quote for about a hundred and something thousand dollars to do it, we couldn't afford that. So I went and saw crane, copper and aluminium and convinced them to do it for cost in return for which they could use it in their advertising and submit it for a prize so that they'd get publicity. And when it was opened, it, I'm surprised it didn't win a prize actually uh, because it was very highly thought of and it's an excellent space. And then <coughs> it needed some decoration. So I knew John Coburn, the artist, now dead of course, and he had this great tapestry and I saw it and I thought oh this would be great but I couldn't afford it so 
I did a whip around and I think we got maybe 12 or so people, including a couple of the aldermen. Dick Palmasano was one, I remember. I was another, Sir Tristan Antico. I think Ron Luke, if I remember correctly. Uh, and we all put money in and bought the tapestry, which has been really one, one of the prides and joys of the library. And it gives a wonderful finish to a wall. I mean, it was a great thing to have been mayor of Mossman. It's, a, it's an office that interesting people have occupied over the years. George Ferris was another man who was uh, mayor here for some years. He was very high in local government. He became president of the Local Government Association, as did Ron Luke, who also became chairman of the uh, Sydney County Council, the, I'm sorry, Cumberland County Council. That's that there is a um, plaque, a uh, coat of arms in the alderman's room, or the councillor's room as it now is, with, uh, which Ron donated to us. Um, and I later became uh, president of the Local Government Association. So mayors of Mossman have been in the forefront of local government for many years. And Mossman has been uh, a trailblazer in many ways, uh, particularly in financial ways. And particularly under our, the present general manager, used to be town clerk Bib May, very um, astute man, uh, very good with finance and this council has done things that councils many at times its size have not been able to do and remain solvent. Why do I like living in Mossman? It's environment. Um, it, it has an extraordinary sense of being part of a big city, yet there are places where you could be hundreds of miles from a city. You go to Charter Head, you walk through the bushland there, the birds are singing, there are trees around you, you can see glimpses of water. Then you walk out onto a little rocky promontory and spread ahead of you is the high rise of Sydney. So you move from bush to city in an instant. Mm. Uh, so it's that environment that is so wonderful in Mossman.